So today we have Javier Saria that is going to talk to us about the list of inconstant on graphs. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Guillermo, for the invitation to participate in this seminar. And okay, uh, this is um, so. Let me just uh, briefly describe uh, what I'm going to explain. Uh, I'm going to consider the problem of uh, determining or finding the best constant, the best doubling constant uh, on a metric space. So let me stress that. So it's not the best doubling constant for a measure, it's the best doubling cost constant for uh, a metric space. In particular, I will fix my attention on graphs, discrete metric spaces. Um, so I'm going to fix my attention to some particular examples. So I will briefly describe some general results, but then focus my attention on some specific graphs. And then I will, I will try to explain why those graphs are of interest. So I will assume a general notion of what a graph is. So I'm not going to really uh, use many of the uh, techniques on graph theory, so just the basic definitions and a few definite concepts that I will explain in case uh, it's necessary. So in particular for the linear graph, uh, we're going to find um, some estimates which are sharp up to some point, and then I will try to explain why uh, that happens. So in particular, we have equality for the best constant up to n equals a, and this is false for n greater than or equal to nine. And then I will move to a general graph, not only finite. So in general, this is going to be true for finite or infinite graphs. And then we will relate this to some uh, uh, <clears throat> arguments on spectral theory associated to the adjacency matrix of the graph, which, what we call AG that I will define in a moment. And then, show that uh, the spectral radius, so the largest eigenvalue for the matrix gives you an up, a lower bound. And the interest is in proving when that bound actually is, is sharp. So when uh, we actually get equality between the spectral radius plus one and the optimal constant. And in particular, we will then study the case when the constant is smaller, is less than or equal to three, which is related to some previous work of John Smith, John Howard Smith, on uh, determining uh, graphs with a fixed, uh, with a spectral radius uh, less than or equal to two. So I will, I will try to lay those two in a moment. So uh, then this is before. This is a joint work with Steve Alidu and Cartagena and Pedro Prada. Mm -hmm. So I will <clears throat> so a few years ago Pedro actually gave a talk in, in this seminar. So I don't know if you all came to that <laughs> lecture. And so you already so in this talk he proved uh, so this is uh, the starting point of all this theory. Uh, so we were able to prove what is the best constant for a general um, metric space for the doubling constant. And in any case, I'm going to start by reviewing some of the preliminary and motivating those results. Mm -hmm. So let's start with the basic. So we have a general metric space. So in all this argument, we have D is fixed. So the metric is fixed on X. And then we consider among all uh, doubling measures, so measures satisfying standard inequality. Uh, so we assume uh, very uh, concrete, I mean, necessary conditions. So balls are uh, uh, measurable mm -hmm. with respect to mu. They have finite and positive measures so that everything makes sense. 
And then space satisfying this inequality that the measure of the ball of radius two R is bounded by a constant uniformly on R times the measure of the ball of radius R. That's what we call a Dublin measure. And space FD with that measure mu is called a space of homogeneous type. And these are some conditions that we assume. And then the optimal constant on that inequality is what we call C mu. So this mu, this constant, of course, depends on X and D, which are fixed, the metric space, but it also depends on mu. Okay. And of course, this constant is greater than or equal to one. It's only one when X is just single point. So for now, we will assume that X has at least two points. So that's a standard. And then in this uh, previous uh, work with Pedro, um, so the, the motivation to consider the best constant for the doubling inequality for the doubling measure came from um, trying to obtain optimal estimates for weak type uh, boundedness of the Hardy operator on discrete spaces. So this is also something related to the work of now and Tao for the homogeneous tree. And when you try to prove uh, this weak type estimates, then you end up considering trivial, I mean, the standard techniques like uh, covering lemmas, uh, properties of the Dublin measure, the overlapping of those, those coverings. So we were interested, since our goal was to find optimal estimates, we wanted to find the optimal constant in the Dublin condition. And this was what uh, motivating motivation for considering this calculation. And then that's when we started to do that, we observed that that constant had an, an expected lower bound. And so we started to proceed to see whether we could actually determine what was the best uh, optimal constant in general. And that was the main goal for this previous work. What is the lowest possible value for the Dublin constant on the metric space. Okay. <clears throat> so now we, we define this constant, which is the infimum among all Dublin constant for all Dublin measures on the metric space. So this constant now does not depend on, it's just the metric uh, constant. And of course, there are several things that uh, we should explain. Uh, not all metric spaces um, um, support a doubling measure. So uh, we see examples. So, for example, on Q with the uh, Euclidean distance, there are no uh, doubling measures. So in general, for the homogeneous tree, so this is a, a tree where all vertices have K neighbors. Uh, it's also easy to prove that. Uh, doesn't support any any doubling measure. Uh, in those cases, then we will say that the constant is equal to infinite. And another interesting example is that I'm on a Banach space. So uh, the existence of the doubling measures is equivalent to saying that the space is the Euclidean space. So it's just a finite dimensional concept. So this is important because of course, uh, the Banach space is complete. And so this shows that completeness on the metric space that does not guarantee the existence of doubling measures. And this comes into the following argument. Um, <coughs> well, there is also a notion of uh, being homogeneous, which is due uh, to Koifman and Weiss. It's the fact that uh, we say that <coughs> Well, this, this is what uh, it is usually called that the space is a doubling space. Okay. So if on a metric space, we have the existence of the doubling measure, then you can prove that on a ball of radius 2R, there is a fixed amount of uh, balls of radius uh, R or any S less than 2R, in fact. So, uh, well, this is, um, the same as saying that uh, you cannot find more than n points whose distance is bigger than a given r. So you cannot separate the points arbitrarily. Uh, 
And so the importance of this notion is that being a double in space is just a metric condition it does not depend on the existence of a doubling measure. Okay, so it's just a metric thing. While the, existence, the measure is with your further information. So this result tells you that being homogeneous in the sense of the existence of the doubling measure implies a geometric condition, right? Uh, so what about the converse? <coughs> well, for the converse, well, this is a proof that Rn is a double space, right? On a measure, this ball of radius one. So we take smaller balls of radius one third in this case. Uh, then in R2, you can find at most seven balls disjoint inside that. So this is just the notion of being doubling in the metric sense. And this is an important result. And for the converse, so the, there was a pre, uh, first result by Volver and Konyagin in 1988. And they were able to prove that being doubling and if the space was compact, or well, the metric space was compact, and that was extended by Lukainen and Saxman 10 years later, just to the condition of being complete, then uh, you could always find, but using very uh, non-constructive uh, arguments, the existence of a doubling measure. So being doubling in the metric sense, plus completeness already imply the uh, existence of the doubling measure. Okay. But as I said, being complete is not enough to get the, the existence of, of doubling measure. Okay. So this is the best uh, result we can actually get in uh, relating those two conditions. Now I want to quantify a bit the result by Koifman and Weiss. <coughs> so, um, so this is a bit technical, but it's easy to understand. So suppose that we have a fixed ball, the space is, is homogeneous, so that we have this doubling measure in the space. And suppose that we have uh, n disjoint balls of radius s, fixed s, where s is smaller than 2r, and that's a necessary condition for this to happen. Then the number n, the number of balls, of disjoint, disjoint balls that you can find inside, that larger ball is controlled by this quantity. So this already implies if r and s are fixed, that um, the number of, I mean, that the space is, is homogeneous in the, in the metric sense, it's if you have already one doubling measure. <clears throat> And it's quantitative, so this will allow us to actually get sharp results. So this is not sharp for a given R and S, but um, uh, asymptotically it gives uh, optimal bounds in some cases. Okay. All right. So in particular, this allows us to prove some lower estimate on a general. Uh, so probably some, some of you already know this facts because these are very standard and well known. So on any metric space, the doubling constant is greater than or equal to a square root of two. So as easy as that. So take two points, <coughs> take uh, the ball of radius, uh, the distance divided by two. And then these, boy, these balls are disjoint and they are both contained inside the larger ball of radius three R hat. So it's just triangle inequality. And then using the quantitative estimate, uh, you are able to prove that uh, the constant is greater than or equal to the square root. Okay. So the constant is, we usually say, let's see be a constant greater than one. Now you can say it's greater than the square root of two. But then um, at some point we were also able to prove a lo better lower estimate. And we were very excited because this number is special, it's the golden number of ratio. I don't know how much. So we thought, okay, if this is sharp, then that would be really wonderful. <clears throat> but then it's not. <clears throat> I mean, proving this was not uh, immediate. So. And finally, we were we were able to prove that uh, the constant is always greater than or equal to two. 
Okay. In any metric space, of course, with at least two points. <clears throat> and so once we prove that, and of course, uh, we have to prove that this is sharp, so that, that there is a metric space with constant equals two. We will see several examples of that. So the first one is how do you prove that, uh, for example, for the Euclidean space with any LP norm, uh, this constant is two to the n. Okay. So it's important to observe that if you take the Lebe measure, that gives you an upper bound, okay, because the constant is the increment among all doubling um, constants. And for the Lebe measure, you trivially get that the constant doubling constant is two to the n. But then using Koichman and Rice's uh, quantitative version of the inequality, uh, you can prove that for any other doubling measure on Rn, any doubling measure, the constant, I mean, you can get something as close as, uh, so the infimum, so you, you don't get anything lower than, than two to the n. Okay. So um, two to the n is, is optimal. Yes. In, in the example, the norm is particularly, do you have the same bound for every norm? Probably you can, because it's just a question of proving since all norms are equivalent, that you can actually bound. So you give a ball, you, you get the larger and smaller ball inside and outside with a control ratio. And, and that's always the case for, for norm scenario. So the P is the case you prove. The P. The P is what? The case you prove. Ah, you, we prove for, for P, okay. yeah. But uh, what, what I say is that for, it's just a geometric uh, uh, remark to, to say that for any other norm, the argument that we use uh, will all also work. <clears throat> okay, so in particular in R, you get that the constant is two, and therefore the result that we prove is, is, is optimal. You cannot get anything lower, better than two. Okay, so up to here is Pedro's talk. Uh, some years ago, before pandemic, I think. Now, um, <clears throat> okay, so I mean, in, in that work, in that paper, we already consider more examples in the discrete setting of graphs, which will also come out in, in this talk. Uh, but there were still some open cases, and, and well, we continue to consider for those graphs. So the idea, um, the good, I mean, the things that why we are, why do we like this, this theory is that it relates pro geometric properties of the graph or different classes of graph with uh, metric or topological concepts. So we can somehow describe particular families of graphs in terms of their own parameters related to this uh, analytic question, which is something. <coughs> Uh, which we, we, we think is interest, interesting. So now we have a graph. So we have a bunch of points, or a bunch of points, finite or infinite, and a relate. So two points can can be related or not. If they are, then they are called neighbors. If they are not, they are not neighbors. And between two neighbors, you can draw a line or curve, whatever you like. So in the, the importance is, is that uh, they are related. You can put whatever you like. If you want to represent the graph, it, it, it's not important what uh, graphical representation you use, okay? Now the distance on this graph is what's called the shortest path distance. So given two points, so we assume the graph is connected. So we can go from one point to another neighbor, 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 neighbor. And then we count the number of edges. And on <laughs> all possible paths, you choose the one with the uh, minimum amount of, of edges. Okay? That's B geo, A geodesic. And that's the distance on the graph. Okay? <clears throat> that's metric on G. It's the standard. <laughs> it's a few uh, general, well, these are just notations. So B is the number, is the set of vertices. E is the set of pairs, which are of vertices, which are neighbors, and they are called the edges. The neighbors, so the uh, vertices at distance one, so these are the neighbors, are called usually N of V, V is a vertex. 
The degree of a vertex is uh, the number of, of neighbors. We will always assume that uh, a vertex has a finite amount of neighbors. Although from one point to the other, the degree uh, may not necessarily be bounded. If it's bounded, then we call it capital delta. So that's the maximum degree of, of G. <clears throat> and for now, now I will look. So the distance is fixed. So it's just the shortest path distance. So the constant on G, we will refer to it as CG. <coughs> Uh, is it true that on graphs, uh, well, we already, I already said that there are graphs, infinite graphs for which this constant is infinite, so there are no doubling measures. <clears throat> but of course, if the graph is finite, then all measures are doubling. Okay. It's just a, finding a maximum, there is a finite number of balls. But the question is not. Uh, whether uh, there are uh, doubling measures, the question is how to optimize, how to find the optimal constant among all those possible measures. <clears throat> and this is also something to stress that uh, the cardinality, counting the number of vertices on a ball, that's a particular measure on G, is not true. Of course, on finite graphs, it's always doubling, everything is doubling, <clears throat> but. There are examples of infinite graphs on which the cardinality measure is not doubling. And that's an open question. How do you characterize a priori in terms of the geometry of the graph that the cardinality is a doubling measure? Well, I, I don't know. <clears throat> there are some necessary conditions in terms of the parameter describing the graph. In particular, that implies that it has to be locally finite, meaning that each vertex has a finite number of of neighbors, of vertices at distance one. Uh, and as I said, there are uh, infinite graphs, of course, where no doubling measure exists. Okay, and the case of uh, the homogeneous tree. Okay. Now, I start with uh, some uh, trivial estimates. Uh, so you are given a finite graph to start with n vertices. And so take the cardinality measure, and then each ball has at most n points trivially, and each ball has at least one point. So you always have this bound on the cardinality. And since the optimal constant is always smaller than the constant for any doubling measure, then the constant on a graph is always bounded between two, of course. This is the previous theorem and between the number of vertices of the graph. Okay, so that's an easy estimate. And it's also interesting to prove that um, using compactness argument can be proved on finite graphs that um, you always have a, a measure for which the constant is attained. And this is what we will call a doubling minimizer. Means a doubling minimizer. If quality holes. It's also interesting to observe that if you uh, consider any automorphism on G, well, an automorphism is just a permutation of the vertices, preserving the fact that if two vertices are neighbors, then the image are also neighbor. That's an if and only if, okay? So in particular, um, if uh, you consider an automorphism on G, so that's the, yeah. Then uh, you can always find a doubling minimizer so that um, it is invariant under any automorphism. So in particular, so this is an easy thing to prove. Uh, if G is vertex transitive, meaning that any two vertices, for any two vertices, you can find an automorphism mapping one into the other. For example, if you consider the cycle, you take any two vertices, you rotate them. Okay, that's an example. If you can consider the complete graph, all vertices are neighbors. Any permutation is an automorphism. But if you consider the line graph with three vertices, then the center cannot be mapped into any of the two leaves, the endpoints. So the automorphism group is, uh, that's an important object in graph theory. Uh, we will use this. Uh, Okay, 
not the right button. So in particular, this is an important remark. So if, if G is vertically transitive, that implies that the graph is regular. Regular means that all vertices have the same degree. Uh, the converse is not true. Well, we are not going to use that, but that's an important remark. If there are regular graphs, so vertices having the same number of neighbors. <coughs> and there are examples where two vertices cannot be mapped into the other uh, via an automorphism. Well, in particular, if the graph is vertex transitive, then the cardinality is a double minimizer. So that's a, an important thing. So because uh, finding this, I mean, this is a, a condition involving all doubling measures, but it reduces to just the cardinality, which is in general much easier to, to <coughs> Yes, just a question. So this result applies to Cayley graphs. Right. In particular, that's so yeah, yeah. Well, we have a, a list of examples, and that's that's one of those. <clears throat> okay. Some uh, properties about the collection of doubling minimizers. Well, there is a trivial remark if, if mu is a doubling minimizer, any positive dilation of mu. It's a doubling minimizer as well because when you take quotients, that constant cancels. So, doubling min minimizers are not unique, right? But they can be just a ray. Right? And so, we call this class BM of G, could be empty. But if it is not, for example, uh, so if we already assume that it's a doubling measure. Then this is a not empty convex cone. Okay, so we have that it is trivially a cone. Well, trivially, I mean it's invariant under positive dilations. The sum is also easy to prove that it is a minimizer. All right. Uh, so there are examples showing that in fact um, this set is not just uh, uniquely determined by a measure. Uh, okay. For example, on the non-negative integers and the natural numbers, uh, this collection of uh, measures, you see, it is equal to one, except at the endpoint j equals one, the leaf of, the, of this tree, where you place any positive alpha. These are not, uh, one is not the, the multiple of the other, right? But all of them are minimizers for the natural numbers. And so, <clears throat> so this can be a big set. In fact. Mm -hmm. However, if you complete n and you consider the integers, then you can prove okay, the integers is a vertex transitive uh, graph that you can map any two integers into the others by just flipping the whole integers. You cannot do that on n, right? You cannot map a point different from one into one, right? They don't have the same degree. Uh, so in, on the integers, uh, we have that uh, the minimizers are uniquely determined by the cardinality. And yes, it should be because it's perfect transitive. So in general, for example, for the linear graph, this is something that um, we don't really know yet if uh, this set is, is just a ray. So we don't know uniqueness on LM. On LM. Okay, so examples of um, the doubling measures on, on particular graphs. So for the complete graph, you get um, the uh, Highest possible value n and equality holds if and only, in fact, this is the, the only graph uh, attaining the maximum possible value. Uh, cycles, they all have uh, constant equals three. And for example, for the start graph, all, all these examples, the previous ones, are vertex transitive. So you can prove this is also a, a general fact. Uh, on regular graphs is that the largest eigenvalue for the adjacency matrix is just the maximum degree. So the maximum degree on Km 
is n minus one, and then is n plus one, which is equal to n. The maximum on on the cycle, the maximum degree is equal to two, right here. And then uh, the as I said in the introduction, the constant in that case is equal to one plus the largest eigenvalue, value, which is two, which is the maximum degree, one plus two equals three. Now for the start graph, this is not vertex transitive. You cannot map the center into the, any of the leaves. They have different degree, but still you can prove that you can actually find the best constant in that case. And, but now it's important to observe that in this case, the cardinality measure is not uh, an extremal uh, doublet minimizer. So it's, this is attained at a different measure. Okay, so that was already known. So what about another case, the case of the linear graph? <clears throat> so these are just uh, the path graph. Okay. There are two leaves and all the others have degree equal, equals two. Well, um, of course, uh, if you consider the cardinality measure, then you can prove that the constant is bounded by three easily. Uh, this is the infimum among all those, and this is greater than or equal to two. So the, all these constants are between two and three. And this is also interesting, at least uh, it's an important tool that we have used many times, is that you can always find, so uh, this graph, what are the automorphisms of LN? Well, you can map this leaf into that leaf, the second into the n minus one, the third into that, right? Mm -hmm. So once you know that the values on the example half, the left part of the graph, then by symmetry, you have the other part. And then what is important is that we can always prove that the existence of a stream of doubling minimizer, which is increasing between the leaf and the middle point or the two middle points. Okay. It's increasing in the half part and then, of course, decreasing. Uh, well, this requires an argument, but it's, it can be easily proved. Uh, <coughs> then, uh, this is where the first uh, estimates we were able to prove for the linear graph. We were happy to prove that uh, we, we have this equality and we found the extreme, the extreme measure. And then we thought that this was going to be true for any n. So uh, we have already this to hold up to n equals a. So it's reasonable to expect this to hold for any other value. And then we are saying <laughs> that no, uh, this fails already for n equals nine. And in that case, we were still able to prove that this constant is the largest root, positive root of this irreducible polynomial. And then you calculate all these values. That's it, no, here. And you see that that root is of that order and this number is that, that order and they are different. Well, it's clear that the, those two values do not agree. Now, um, well, this is the reason why um, <clears throat> this doesn't fall, and, and it's important because I'm going to motivate the uh, introduction of a new parameter. <clears throat> so it's the fact that when you have just uh, eight points on, on the graph, in this case on, on the path graph, I, it suffices to consider at the bottom uh, balls of radius are less than one, that is just one single point, and then on top, you get at most three points on this graph. But for when n gets bigger than eight, then you need larger radii. And, and so what is what this related to one plus the cosine? Why is that important? We well, will see that in a moment. So then we introduce a second parameter. So we put a zero on top. This zero comes because uh, we are taking at the bottom balls of radius zero, okay? So these balls are closed. So the ball of radius zero is just the center of the ball on, on the graph. 
And then on top, we just consider balls of radius one. It's important to observe that one is equal to two times zero plus one. All right. Uh, and this is what it amounts to. So we just consider for a fixed vertex, we just consider the set of neighbors, then we measure that set with new, take the quotient and take the supreme. Of course, this quantity is less than C mu, right? Because it's just, a, so it could be like a restricted doubling constant. And so if we consider the infimum among all doubling measures on, on the graph, then we get the new constant Z zero G, which is of course the lower bound for CG, okay, for what we want to find. Then, uh, so this can, I will say why, but then this equality is true for any M. Okay, so these are the values for the restricted doubling constant on the graph. But uh, this equality again, as I said, is only true for R two n equals eight. And <clears throat> so the general result that we were able to prove is the following. So uh, I already mentioned the adjacency matrix. So this is the matrix. So we consider our graph to be simple. And simple means that there are no uh, edges between a vertex and itself. Okay? So there are no loops. And there's only one vertex, uh, sorry, edge between two vertices, either one or zero. So this is a symmetric matrix with zeros on the diagonal and then on the rest zero or one, depending on whether the vertices are neighbors or not. Okay. So this is a, this is a <coughs> matrix. And then the main result that uh, we have proved is that this restricted constant C0G is uh, one plus the spectral radius of the adjacency matrix, or the largest eigenvalue of A. And this is a consequence of the Perron Provenius uh, theorem. And what, what is also interesting is that uh, this result already gives you the extremal, the doubling. Uh, minimizer, which is called the Perron 3, which is just the eigenvector of the largest eigenvalue, which is the unique vector with the positive uh, entries. So, so all the components are positive up to multiplication, of course. Sorry, but this yes. is true for the path graph? No, this is true for any finite for any graph. graph. For any finite graph. So, we, yes. This is C. Sorry? Zero missing there is a zero missing here, right? Sorry, this is a zero. Yes, yes. this is, is minim, it's doubling minimizer restricted. Um, what happens if the eigenvector has some entries that are zero? This could happen, right? In the no, no, not in the Perron three, not in this case, not in the Perron three, not in the Perron eigen, eigenvector. So, the all entries, so the theorem tells you that all entries are positive. Maybe I said non-negative. Uh, no, 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 no. You said positive. Oh, right. I, the way you remember that term, you could have zeros. <laughs> you you can't still reducible. If, if the matrix is irreducible, then all, oh, right. all the all the is strictly positive. Yeah, but the graph is connected. So. Yes, so it's connected, so you have uh, that <laughs> reducible. Okay. And so we will extend this to infinite graphs. Yes. Sorry, what if it was strongly connected? Excuse me? Strongly connected or just connected? Uh, connected? connected. Yes. Right. <laughs> we don't assume any further condition, just that uh, there is always a path between two vertices. So in particular, if uh, you apply this to the linear graph, the path graph, then this is the condition. So, this is the largest eigenvalues, twice the cosine of pi over n plus one, plus one. This is the Perron eigenvector. And, and then we finally prove that uh, this equality only holds up to n equals eight. Okay. All right, so this is an interesting table of values. So these are the one plus two cosines. Sometimes you can actually specify the value of that. Sometimes you can't, so that depends on some arithmetic properties of N. 
And these are the reducible, the minimal polynomials for which these are the, the roots. Now for, um, the infinite linear paths, so there are several extensions. Uh, we actually are able to prove that uh, the optimal constants, either the general or the restricted ones, are equal to three on the case of integers and natural numbers. Uh, in general, we are able also to prove um, that these constants grow up. Uh, there is an open, still, problem that uh, we are not able to solve, which is related to the fact that we can, well, I would say that in a moment, but we cannot prove that if, if a graph is a subgraph of a larger one, then the constant increases. So we cannot prove the monotonicity on the doubling constant, and that has some consequence. Okay, but this is um, <coughs> the estimate that we were able to prove. So the lower bound, lower bound is a pretty result. And they are always bounded strictly by three of these numbers, and they are monotonously increasing. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So this is a, also a technical and but very interesting result for us, which is going to motivate some of the things I'm going to say in a moment. Is that you give me any um, finite graph? So I mean, this is in. In, in, in the path graph. So the, all this re refers to the path graph. Now, uh, yes, um, we are able to prove that there exists a vertex between the leaf and the middle point, the J, which is uniform. It doesn't depend on the doubling minimizer. So that if you take just the trivial average, so radius zero at the bottom, one on top, then you already have the optimal constant. So the optimal constant for this doubling minimizer is attained at the vertex and precisely for a trivial um, quotient. Right? And then on the leaf, you can always get the optimal constant, but then here the radius depends on, on some value, which is not yet determined. That is an upper bound, but it's not explicitly determined. Okay? And moreover, these two values are the same, of course, because uh, you have that, uh, this is optimal. But the, the important thing is that they both give the optimal constant. Okay? So for any doubling measure, you know that that constant is attained on both of radius zero at the bottom on the vertex, the fixed vertex between the leaf and the center, and on some ball on the leaf. And okay, and then in particular, you can find a symmetric measure, uh, symmetric uh, doubling uh, minimizer for which this is true. Okay? So this is a, another property. Uh, okay, um, so this uh, opens up the possibility of considering the following argument. So this is what I just said. So given every symmetric doubling measure, we can find this is true. So we know that the, uh, the, the best constant is attained on the leaf and on the uh, left. Hand side or right hand side leaves one and n for a certain ball for a certain radius. And then, whatever this means, we have a whole bunch of computational support showing that there exists a doubling minimizer for which this is true. <coughs> is that for every vertex between the leaf and the two leaves, uh, the constant is attained on both of radius zero at the bottom. So we know that this is true for at least one vertex, but then when you go through the examples, this is true for any vertex in all the uh, examples we have been able to work with the computer for larger values of n. And if you think about this, 
this opens up the possibility of in, uh, implementing a, a, an algorithm <clears throat> to actually determine the measure mu. So I will explain this briefly. Uh, so for uh, the first vertex, this is this k uh, is undetermined, but for the second vertex there up, up to the middle one, because by symmetry, the others are just the same. You have all this bunch of uh, unknowns, but also all this collection of uh, equations. So these are rational equations, right? That's just the polynomials of the degree one on the top and at the bottom. And a priori, you, uh, you are able, you can actually solve this in, in all the unknowns and finding the optimal constant. So the, the conjecture was true. So we have checked all this up to where my computer was able to do it in finite time. And so for example, so we get not only the value, but also the extremal reducible polynomial uh, on which this is true. Okay. All right, so we thought that maybe the linear path was going to give us the same answer or same solutions as, as the other trivial examples for uh, complete graph cycles or star graphs where the optimal constant is, is explicit. But we are now changing our mind and probably for LN for the path graph, there is no explicit solution other than finding a polynomial for which you can say it's the largest uh, positive root of that. Probably this is the best we can say for, for a general end. Um, okay, just a few uh, remarks about the general case. So we know that there are graphs for which the counting measure is not minimizer. There exists an infinite graph uh, where the counting measure is not doubling, but uh, there is another measure which is doubling. And there are graphs where no doubling measures exist. So we can have many different uh, conditions. Okay, so this is the example, I will skip that. But then an important, so this is now for a general graph, an important thing about this restricted uh, doubling constant it, it, it is, is that it is actually monotone. And this is something which we would like to prove for general without the restriction, but it is true for, for uh, this new parameter. And it's also interesting that we can calculate this constant on the general graph just by looking at what happens on finite subgraphs. And for finite subgraph, we have the Perron for Venus theorem. So we can then use that to extend it to a general graph. Uh, just by showing that uh, this operator is bounded on L2, and then we have a spectral radius for that operator on that uh, little space. Okay. But the same argument holds. And another application, which is also interesting, is that um, using Wilf's theorem, which tells us that the chromatic number of a graph is bounded by one plus the spectral radius, the chromatic number is the least k for which j is k colorable, meaning that two vertices which are neighbors should have different color. And for example, for the complete graph, the chromatic <coughs> number is equal to n. For the star graph, the chromatic number is equal to two. And so we have a nice bound. So at least relating so <laughs> geometric conditions on the graph as the chromatic number is with these uh, analytic conditions on the doubling constants, okay? So in particular, Wilf's theorem already gives you the case of equality. And so equality between those constants and the chromatic number only holds for the complete graph and cycles with odd order. And so this is also a general result. Okay, so this is again related to what I explained before that uh, we can always, so if you give me a double minimizer and you compose with a finite collection of uh, automorphisms of the 
of G. Uh, and then you sum all these compositions. Then this is again a double minimizer with the property that okay, that you get the lower, the better uh, doubling con uh, constant. So th th this is the reason why you can always assume that your measure is invariant under automorphisms on the group on, on the graph. So, and in particular, this shows that if the vertex is transitive, then, <clears throat> then G supports a doubling measure if and only if uh, the cardinality is doubling. Okay, so then that's an important uh, geometric condition. That's the doubling cardinal, the, the cardinality is the easiest measure you can have on the graph. <clears throat> so just to finish, uh, the question now it remains is that when is it true that those two constants agree. So when is the doubling constant equal to the uh, restricted doubling constant? And okay, so th this is a, an interesting lemma it can be easily proved. So I'm going to skip this proof. But it tells us that uh, the doubling constant agrees with the restricted doubling constant if and only if uh, for the Perron eigenvector you have that equality. So what is the importance of that? Well, um, finding this is trivial. It's just to study the spectrum of the, of the graph. And then uh, the Perron tree, the Perron uh, minimizer, the Perron eigenvector is given by, is explicitly given by uh, the result by the uh, Perron Frobenius theorem. And finding this constant is trivial because it reduces to balls of radius zero and one on top. So finding this, which is hard, reduces to finding that, which is trivial. And okay, so this is the proof. And so in particular, if you apply these to graphs of diameter two, which are it's a class of graphs actually more complicated than one should expect a priori because diameter two, diameter two uh, looks like uh, there are no many examples, but that's a big class of graphs. So for those graphs, we were able to actually prove that uh, uh, the optimal constant is actually restricted constant. So examples, well, this is called the friendship graphs, which are given like that. Uh, depart complete departed graphs, uh, real graphs, cocktail party graph, Peterson graph, which is also interesting because it enjoys some minimality conditions on some of them. And so the last thing that I want to present is that uh, we were able to also characterize all graphs with doubling constant bounded by less than or equal to three. In particular, these are all finite graphs having that property. Okay. So this the linear cycle, these two special graphs, this is DN, which is the natural numbers with uh, two legs. And this is the, not, uh, sorry, this is the path graph with two legs, and this is with four legs. Uh, I will call the infinity, the natural numbers with two legs, because this is the, Characterization that we get for infinite graphs. So infinite graphs with constant doubling constant less than or equal to three are just those three examples. And moreover, um, you calculate that constant for those, and that constant is actually equal to three. So in particular, for infinite graphs, we can improve the result that we have is that the doubling constant is. So it cannot be anything between two and three. So it has to be greater than or equal to three. So I don't know why it's true, but okay. Uh, so this is the problem. Uh, just skip it because I think I'm almost done, right? So, and thank you for your attention. <laughs> Um, uh, Javier, the, the original definition of a doubling constant 
you put the three instead of the two? Yeah. This what happens? I already thought about that this morning because I, I thought, well, maybe this is a good question. Um, okay. So you may think, okay, trivially then the lower bound is three. Uh, if you do that in Rn, then following the same arguments, the best constant in Rn, if you choose any R, not three, but any R bigger than one is R to the N. But if you go to a graph, then a different thing happens. So for example, for the complete graph, if R is greater than or equal to two, nothing changes. The best constant is N. But if R is more than two, then the constant is one. So when you change R, the geometry of the graph enters into, so it, it, it's, it's important because when you calculate the best constant, you have to look at balls. Which balls do I get for that R? So you, you, you fix the radius, A, or we like call R this. So if the radius is S, then on top you have a ball of radius R times S. And depending on the graph, this can be uh, very different depending on the dilation R. So in the case when R is less than two on, it, on the complete graph, you always get or either, so you always get the same at the top and at the bottom. You get nothing different. So the constant is always equal to one. So I, I assume that uh, there are some conditions on the metric space which actually uh, give you different answers for different values of R. So it's not true that, so probably what, what is, it's not true that the lower bound is equal to R because I, I gave you a graph where the lower bound is equal to one. Uh, but then for some graphs, probably I mean, we change the two by R and nothing changes. So, so this is a, something that uh, is still to be considered. What happens when you change the, the radius and the dilation of the definition of W measure? <clears throat> Okay, thank you. Um, I'm not, I don't see why, but um, in which sense the spectrum of the adjacency matrix is fixing the, the constant. So you have this result with the highest, <coughs> largest eigenvalue. So you have two graphs which are not isomorphic, yes. but isospectral. Yeah? Yes. Do they have, well, if I understood correctly, they have the same restricted. Right. But is it true also that they have the same minimal doubling constant? So is the spectrum fixing somehow, or is it both? Not, I don't, no, no, no. You don't? Not the doubling, no, no, I'm, I'm, I, I don't have an explicit example, but um, I'm sure that uh, for graphs having the same spectrum, but not isomorphic, iso they are not iso, so they are isospectral, but not isomorphic. Yeah. And there are very simple examples with uh, finite graphs with that condition. Um, I'm sure that you can find two of those graphs having different doubling constant, but the same restricted doubling constant. Uh -huh. So you say that you cannot hear the shape of the, no. the constant. You say, excuse me. You cannot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. You can't. <laughs> Not for for. I mean, if the graph has diameter two or some other conditions, yeah, yeah. yeah. In general, no, but not not in general. Okay, I have two questions. The first one is, uh, how do you obtain the, the uh, those minimal polynomials from which you get uh, you uh, mm -hmm. the minimal constant? Are there some factors of the graphic characteristic polynomial of the edges in? Uh, mm, edges? No, no, no. They, they they are not related to the characteristic polynomial of, of the matrix. Uh, we were able to obtain some of them for small values of n just by going to the inequalities and optimizing. So we were able to optimize and then use some friend, <laughs> this guy, and up to some point. So you, you can explicitly solve and get the root, I mean, get the optimal value, the 
extreme algorithm, <laughs> maximum, uh, by reducing it to the root of a polynomial. That's how, at least I use Mathematica, gives you the solution when it's not explicit. <laughs> okay, and so, but it's not in general, so it's not related that polynomial to the, the characteristic polynomial of the adjacency matrix. And there is no standard procedure to obtain it. Yeah, I mean, the algorithm, well, uh, for small values, you, you, you can actually do it, by, do it just by writing explicitly. It takes time to all the different quotients, and then you rule out some of them because you compare to others and you see they are smaller. So, so you give me a particular graph, and sooner or later, I can write down the, the system I, I can optimize, and I think I can get you the solution by means of this optimization. But, but if the conjecture were true, then we would have a very explicit uh, algorithm to find this for any, for any uh, but it's still not explicit. Yeah, but that would be for the line graph. Only. For the line graph, yes. So the algorithm is for the line graph. This other method works for any other finite graph. It has to be fine. And the second question, um, is that have, have you considered a graph in which the distance is not the minimal but no. just a, like a weight? Uh, then that, that, that's going to change the uh, whole thing. Yeah. Once you change the metric, you can have many. So if you change the metric on the complete graphs, the complete graphs, you have only two, two questions. Uh, just the point and the whole thing and nothing else. But if you change the metric, then you will start having all possible questions probably. Is the doubling constant of a finite graph always algebraic? Uh, well, that's a good question because uh, we were at some point thinking, can we characterize which numbers are doubling constants for? And <laughs> it's algebraic. All the examples that we have uh, are <laughs> algebraic. <laughs> yes. But um, well, might there be a number which is algebraic but which isn't a doubling constant? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Yes. Uh, the smallest. So I think that for one plus anything between one. No, so anything between two and one plus root two is not the doubling constant of any thing, at least for graph, but probably for any metric space. And the other, the, that what you said? For graphs, uh, could be algebraic. It should be because it's, in the end, you have this. Uh, list of, yeah. of, of, of algebraic inequalities, hmm. and you're kind of optimizing them, so and that always leads to an algebraic. Yeah. So but for, for linear, for the path, um, well, uh, well, not in general, yes, oh, yeah, yeah, yes, in that case, you have a, yes, uh, but that's for finite graph, by uh, for, for graph, yeah, but for yeah. graph, yeah. if the conjecture is true. No, 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 what, what Pedro is saying that you can always <coughs> just find the quotient of any two balls, I mean, a ball and, and the doubling. And then write the inequality. The constant has to be uh, so. So, so you have a what is it called? The, uh, well, um, so you you have to optimize the constant on a on a simplex, and then you use the, the simplex, the simplex method. And then <laughs> that, that the, the equations that we have are 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 quotient of linear polynomials. Right. And therefore, probably the solution is given by the solution of a polynomial. So it's an algebraic number. I actually have a question for the line graph. Hmm. Uh, are there examples of measures that get very close to three as n grows? Uh, as n tends to infinity, yes. then it tends to three. Uh, so, and how does it grow? Because maybe there is no explicit formula, but. Maybe you can well, it grows faster than one plus cosine pi over yeah. n plus. <laughs> but, but, right, but that's from below. Do the examples from above give a better? You see, it, even for for the small values, you get something which is very close to, to three. And so we, we have not estimated that error. I mean, the, the, the distance to the 
one, two, three. External. Are you giving an example of a measure which is whose constant is strictly smaller than three? If it took a while, yeah, so that's already proving that it's strictly less than three, the optimal constant for the land. We didn't know that uh, from the very beginning. Yeah. Any questions? Okay, let's go. Let's <laughs> thinking again. Okay.